Away from that embarking the country, it used to be a passing stop on the trafficking route to Europe, but Kenya is becoming a major destination in itself for heroin. Addiction is rising as tons of powder pass through East Africa. I can assure you the number is growing because now of also the situation of COVID. Yeah, there's a depression, uh, people are kind of uh, confused uh, from the beginning when COVID came. Uh, people started with alcohol, uh, people lost jobs. So all that when you put it together, you find the long results is getting themselves into drugs. It has improved my life very much because now I have a very good relationship with my family. I can manage my money, the small that I get. I'm clean, I'm healthy. Yeah, it has really changed my life. Now, David Johnson Onelatit, or Onelalit, the brother of Dominic Ongwen, a Ugandan child soldier who became a commander in the notorious Lord's Resistant Army, Ellery, says he is shocked by the sentence of 25 years Ongwen received for war crimes and crimes against humanity from the International Criminal Court. I thought that it was going to be nine years. But I shock when I hear 25 years. I feel very, very painful. Everyone, huh? they're not, they are, they are not okay in the family. Because right now, as I talk, I feel like uh, no one, no one. If 25 years old right now, do you think where are we going to be? He was doing that thing for the, uh, his father, which is Joseph Coin, law, but not himself. Elsewhere, nearly 30 abducted Nigerian college students reunite with their loved ones two months after being kidnapped by heavily armed gunmen in the north of the country. If I see uh, rain is coming, I started thinking of, of how are they doing the bush. When it is night, I don't know how they are sleeping or eating. If I want to drink what I'm thinking of them, but I give God the glory. God has done it for us. God has done it for us. A wonderful thing. He brought our children back. Every day, day and night, I'll be crying, weeping of my daughter or our children. We cannot be able to sleep, to eat, to drink. I want to use this opportunity to thank the parents of the victims for their cooperation and understanding during this trying period. For the students, I charge them to take this uh, ordeal as a turning point in their lives. Now to something that gives us focus and uh, this is in reference to our conversation of this uh, day or this morning. The World Health Organization Director General raised an alarm following India's record-breaking wave of COVID-19 cases and deaths saying the organization is putting its best efforts to help address the surging crisis with a goal to save at least 50 million lives who has also or who have also called for action to uh, boost the vaccination exercise against measles and other diseases worldwide as the pandemic has severely disrupted access to routine jobs. Not only get immunization back on track, but do better than before. The immunization agenda 2030 is an ambitious new global strategy to maximize the life-saving impact of vaccines over the next decade. It would mean reducing by half the children who are completely left out of essential vaccines, the zero-dose children. It would, mean, it would mean achieving another 500 
introductions of new and underused vaccines in low- and middle-income countries. It would also mean achieving 90% coverage of the key life-saving vaccines. Well, if there is a time the conversation around vaccines has been heard, is this season. And definitely this has come to the fore to remind us that this is so critical in ensuring that our populations are safeguarded against disease. And to help us understand how vaccines work, why it is so important that our populations take it up and actually adhere, especially to those routine jobs for children, is Dr. Angela Migoa, who is a rheumatologist at the Aga Khan University Hospital. Hospital. Thank you for your time. We are also joined virtually by Ruth Wamboy, who is a health promotion officer at Moranga County. And also joining us is Sahara Ado, who is the County Expanded Program of Immunization EPI for Cold Point at Wajiri County. Thank you, ladies, for being part of this conversation. And uh, Dr. Tari, I think at this point, as I yeah. mentioned, it is so important to clarify so many things around vaccinations and immunizations. And I think the most important place to start is to understand what a vaccine is to start with. Gladys, it's always such a joy to be on your show. Thank you so much for having me. And before we delve into mm -hmm. this topic of vaccines, let me take this opportunity to wish all lupus patients happy World Lupus, oh, lupus Day. Yes, it yeah, is the to day. To all the patients and, you know, their relatives. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so when it comes to vaccines, what are vaccines? Vaccines are a model of medical intervention where you give the body the opportunity to strengthen its defense against all the germs that cause diseases or health problems. Well, not all, but most. Mm -hmm. And how this intervention works is that it requires some introduction of some of the particles of the different components of the various germs that cause uh, infection to allow you to respond. So, you know, we are all blessed with what I call an inborn defense system, the immune system. And there are two fundamental principles that are uh, critical for this uh, inborn defense system to work. The first is recognition, and the second is response. And I think I'll even qualify that further. Appropriate recognition mm -hmm. and efficient response. So what vaccines do, they allow your body, your inborn defense system, to recognize these different germs without the germs necessarily having to cause disease in you. Because if things were to happen naturally, then you should get the infection and mount a defense against it, and a defense that should be lifelong, that has a memory, so that in the event you meet this infection again, you're better prepared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So why do we have vaccines for some conditions and yeah. not others? Yeah. So in the ideal world, we should have vaccines for everything. Okay. In the ideal world. Mm -hmm. But the business of vaccines is such an expensive venture <clears throat> that the people who manufacture vaccines, they look at the global landscape and see what are the diseases that are causing like the highest rates of mortality, not just for children, you know, even adults where applicable, so that we can impact at that level. So I'll give an example. Measles is a disease that has a high mortality. Mm -hmm. It has killed lots of children across the globe. So to try and mitigate against that, then people come up with vaccines. So just because of the expensive nature, the economies of scale don't allow us to make vaccines for everything. Okay. So you're trying to target those vaccines that have a high rate of, you know, causing mortality. And I'll even say morbidity. For example, in the case of polio, mm -hmm. you know, um, uh, if, if a child gets polio, the risk of disability is high in addition to the risk of mortality. So that's what normally helps to inform which diseases do we then form vaccines for? Uh -huh. yeah. Which now explains why the yeah. whole world had yeah. to stop and think about yes. how to create a vaccine against COVID-19. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. Okay. And um, I think as a human race, we were caught between a rock and a hard place, Gladys, 
because <clears throat> for most of the other diseases, we had the luxury of time to, to see what were the long-term impacts uh, of the vaccine. But you see now in a pandemic, and this is really the tragedy of pandemics, it doesn't give you time. Mm -hmm. So now in the storm of the pandemic, you know, preventive medicine is always better, always more cost effective than curative medicine. If you look at what's happening in the landscape, there's more emphasis on the vaccines as opposed to really finding the cure because they know that is what is more economically viable. So the, the dilemma we were in as a human race is that we have this new disease, we don't understand it well, it's claiming so many lives. Yes, there are a lot of efforts trying to find um, the cure, but now you can find that there was an overdrive engagement to get the vaccines. Mm -hmm. And if I could just explain, it's an important concept, Gladys, that we need to, to grasp, not just for COVID vaccine, but also for the other vaccines for children, the concept of herd immunity. If in our studio today, we were six adults and one young baby, the concept of herd immunity is that these six adults should have such a robust immune system, which we said is our inborn defense system, they should have such a robust immune system such that they protect the little baby in the room, okay? And how do we do that for these people? We said naturally, the thing is you should get the disease, then you de de develop your immune system, yeah, yeah. A, a robust immune system. But we don't want to suffer all the negative repercussions of the disease. Mm -hmm. So then what you do, you begin to introduce certain particles that are unique to that particular germ or bug, okay, mm -hmm. that's causing the disease. Like for me today, we could say that this little clip on my head is my unique identifier, right? Mm -hmm. But if I was to cause a disease, you'd need the whole of Angela to cause that particular disease. Uh -huh. But in vaccines, what we're doing, we're saying, no, 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 don't introduce the whole of Angela in quotes, because if you introduce her, she'll make that person sick. Mm -hmm. Introduce this unique identifier. Your defense system is just going to realize, oh my gosh, we are under attack by Angela. So your defense system responds like, I am actually attacking you, but I'm actually not attacking you. That's the concept of vaccines. So in herd immunity, what we are saying is that we will build your defense system and all the other six adults in this room such that if you are exposed to the germ that's causing the infection, mm -hmm. you're already so strong to ward it off that there's no way you'd pass it on to the little baby in the room. Okay. So that's the concept of herd immunity. And for the different diseases, depending on how infectious they are, there's a certain critical percentage of people in a community that should be vaccinated. For example, in measles, we say, for you to have an efficient herd immunity, 95% of the population that is at risk should be vaccinated. Oh, wow, that's a high number. It is a high number. Mm. That's why, and I really applaud our Ministry of Health. They have such robust data regarding this because they know the public health implications. When we take an example of, um, for example, polio. Mm -hmm. In polio, they say, for you to have that effective herd immunity, 80% of the afflicted population should be uh, uh, vaccinated. When it comes to COVID-19, the data we have so far, for the population that is at risk, which I would say is the entire population of Kenya, because yeah. COVID is afflicting everybody. Yeah. For the population at risk, 70% of that population should be vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Given our population of about 50 million, for us to have an effective herd immunity, about 35 million Kenyans need to be vaccinated. Oh, wow. And if you look at, you know, if you listen keenly to what our Ministry of Health officials are saying, you can see they're thinking in that line because they're trying to find ways of how to have homegrown solutions of making this vaccine available because they have projected. They can see this is where we need to go. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now that yeah. we put that into perspective, yeah. I think at this point it will be interesting to just understand how different parts of the country are actually taking up this COVID-19 vaccine now that it is top of mind for everybody. And I'd like to hear from Sahara, Sahara Ado. How is Wajiri County doing in as far as the uptake of COVID-19 vaccine is concerned? Okay, for Wajia County, the mm -hmm. uptake of the COVID-19 is not badly off. Since we have started this vaccination of COVID-19, so far we have reached 
like 2,068 people for the first case, for the first phases, because we are rolling out in phases, and the first phases we have started in March this, this year. The uptake is not badly off, but since we have started fasting Ramadan, because majority of the population here uh -huh. are Muslims, the uptake is very low. We are still talking to the population, to the people who are supposed to come for this first phase mm -hmm. to come and take the vaccine, but generally the uptake is very low. Okay, now apart from the interruption of Ramadan, what are the other reasons perhaps are uh, impeding uptake of the vaccine in the area? Okay, the other uptake is there are, as you all understand, there are a lot of rumors and misinformation about the side effects mm -hmm. that are spreading, leading to the, some fears and confusion. But we have Talk to the community and our healthcare workers because the majority for this first phase, those who are supposed to take these vaccines are our healthcare workers mm -hmm. and security guys, teachers, and those people who are above 58 years. Mm -hmm. But the fear is there's a lot of rumors on the side effect. And we told them mild side effects are normal with any vaccines, even routine immunization, the one we are immunizing the children. It is just the sign that your immune system is responding to this antigen which is introduced into your body. Mm -hmm. The other thing is for our healthcare workers, they are the technical people, but the uptake, if we see that number, I said 2,068 people, out of that number, the health workers are the lowest in uptake. Reason being, they need training. We reach out to them through uh, CME, that is a continuous medical education. Mm -hmm. Then it's because of the side effect rumors. Okay. That is the major thing. Okay, let's hear from another part of the country. Ruth Wamboy joins us from Moranga County. What is the uptake of, or how does the uptake of COVID 19 vaccine look like in that area? Please unmute your mic. Okay, I think we shall get back to Ruth in a moment. But uh, Angela, I think some of the interruptions to the uptake of uh, vaccines yeah. has been said, especially from Sahara's point yeah. of view, <clears throat> and mostly religion in her case because yeah. right now it's the month of ramadan and yeah. also the misconceptions yeah. Yeah. around the symptoms that are coming with the vaccine yeah. tell us more wow god is that's a pandora's box mm. <laughs> <laughs> because um as i said earlier we we were caught between a rock and a hard place because we didn't have the privilege of time to see what would be the long lasting effects mm. um and Human nature is interesting. When you're not sure about something, uh, it's understandable to be skeptical. But what I'm urging um, uh, my colleagues across the divide, not just in healthcare, in the social circles, everywhere, you know, in medical ethics, there are four fundamental principles that guide and govern what we do. The first, Gladys, is beneficence, do good. The second, non-maleficence, do no harm. The third, justice, that irrespective of anyone's background, treat everybody fairly. And the fourth, which is really fundamental, especially in this season we're in, is autonomy. That Gladys, today if you came to my clinic and you brought your child and they had an infection, I would examine and say, okay, you had a throat infection, I recommend you take this antibiotic. But I cannot compel you to take that antibiotic uh -huh. because I have to respect your decision, your autonomy. So if I personally, I am not comfortable with the vaccine, Gladys, truly speaking, it is unethical for me to compel you not to take it. Likewise, if I am convinced that the vaccine is the way to go, 
Gladys, it is unethical for me to compel you to take it. What my role would be is to give you all the facts, the pros and the cons. Just as our sister in Wajir has said, that all vaccines have side effects. Mm -hmm. It's the truth. Don't be fooled. There's not a single vaccine that doesn't have a side effect. All vaccines, and I say categorically, all vaccines have side effects. Common ones are like fever, pain at the injection site. You know, with measles, there's a whole hula baloo that measles vaccine was causing autism. Mm. And later on, it was found out that that was false. And the authors who published that even had their license withdrawn because it has impacted on how measles is uptaken in different parts of the globe. So what I encourage people to do, and you know, Kenyans, you are a reading nation, all right? Go out there, seek all the facts, then make an informed decision. I, as Angela, cannot just come and sway you and you take it as gospel truth. The community health worker or the religious leader, go and seek the facts. Okay, I believe Ruth is now ready for us. Ruth, what is the uptake of the COVID-19 vaccine in Moranga County? In Moranga County, mm -hmm. uh, we have vaccinated uh, approximately 26,000. Okay. That includes the healthcare workers, mm -hmm. uh, the teachers, the uniformed uh, police force, Mm -hmm. and those who are above 58 years. Okay, and what have been the challenges you've been experiencing trying to actually ensure that the population takes up the vaccine? Actually, for COVID-19, because our law is to do demand creation, mm -hmm. uh, we, have, we find that uh, the community, uh, after maybe those ones who are in the first category diffused uh, or maybe did not come as we expected, mm. the community have been uh, flocking in our facilities, trying to uh, to come for the vaccination. So per uh, se, maybe even the vaccines are the ones who have uh, which have been uh, maybe not sufficient, mm -hmm. and uh, the community is really uh, coming for those vaccinations. Okay, and uh, when you think about the routine vaccinations vis-a-vis -vis what we are seeing in as far as COVID-19 is concerned, what is, uh, what is doing better in your area? Sorry? Between the routine Between vaccinations and the COVID-19 vaccination, which one has a higher uptake from your experience? Okay, for the other immunization, there are the five immunizations. Mm -hmm. Uh, we see that uh, when the lockdown came, uh, at least that time uh, our uh, immunization coverage was uh, below uh, 80%. Mm -hmm. But uh, because uh, the, the, current, the mothers were fearing to come to the health facilities yes. uh, uh, due to uh, not to get infected, uh, and also uh, they thought that uh, other uh, services uh, were not ongoing, mm -hmm. but after uh, the uh, after we created awareness and uh, we also uh, used the CHVs for contact tracing uh, for those ones who are not bringing their children to uh, for immunizations, mm -hmm. uh, the uptake went up uh, towards the end of the year. Okay, interesting perspective. And Angela, I think this is uh, something that we need to cover because somebody mm. has asked. Mm -hmm. If it is so critical that mm. we get 35 million, approximately 35 million Kenyans to take up this vaccination yeah. to develop the herd immunity, immunity then yeah. why is it that we are not going door to door seeking out the populations that should be vaccinated? Um, you know, Gladys... I can tell you for free, there's a lot of work that's happening in the background, um, courtesy of the Ministry of Health. Mm -hmm. And remember, we, we exist in a health ecosystem, all right? It's one thing to have the product, the vaccine. You need the personnel mm -hmm. to go door to door. And you heard from our sister in Wajir that the healthcare workers themselves sometimes are a challenge. So you know that the ministry is between a rock and a hard place. Because for example, if you and me are the employees, community health workers at the ministry, we are reluctant to take the vaccine. And we're in a pandemic, truly out of an ethical principle, I cannot shove you to the community to go door to door. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Understand? Because we have a mandate to protect the employees. So I know those are some of the things that the government is grappling with. Then the other thing, uh, Gladys, um, let's not turn a blind eye to the other ramifications of a pandemic. You know, the economic impacts of this pandemic. Remember, there are other health services that have to go on. Antenatal mm -hmm. care, the pregnant moms need to be taken care of. Our patients who've got cancer, hypertension, diabetes need to be taken care of. The other routine vaccinations for the children need to be taken care of. So even at the ministry level, as they are trying to find strategies to solve this, they have to look for solutions that are feasible for them and sustainable. Mm -hmm. And I know those are things that I'm sure that they're already working on. And if you want to know they're working on that, because by the time they're saying that they want to start um, in-country packaging of the vaccines, they are thinking of the whole system, that when we are going to have many more vaccines available, how are we going to roll out? You understand? Because you cannot start taking people uh, door to door and you don't have the vaccine in your pocket to give. Mm -hmm. But I know those are things that the Ministry of Health uh, is working on. So I would say I think it's an issue of time to have all the infrastructure in place before you roll out. Because like again, the childhood vaccinations, I normally tell other clients that irrespective of who has been in leadership in this country, we've never had a challenge with childhood vaccines that there was talk outs. Uh -huh. No, not because of in-house issues, maybe because of other things like manufacturers, yes. right? But never in-house issues, why? Because the government ensures that the systems are robust, sustainable and feasible. It's the same thing with COVID vaccine because the natural inclination is to have a knee-jerk mm. reaction. Yeah? But people who are in policy making, no, they think of the whole system and make sure that every aspect of the system is intact, solid, feasible, sustainable. Because this is not something that we're going to do for two, three months. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, Let's yeah. hear from uh, Sahara. We've had from Ruth in as far as the impact of a pandemic, especially on the routine immunization. How has the pandemic affected the same in Wajir County? Okay. Yeah. And the, the presence of pandemic disease that has caused panic across all the service delivery outlets has threatened our core critical indicators to thrive. Because mm -hmm. there was a profound clinical and community stigma related to COVID-19 that reduced patient caseload in our health facilities. And this was first noted in the month of March 2020, when the first case of COVID-19 disease was diagnosed in Wajia. Mm -hmm. This has caused a lot of wave panic across all our sub-counties, and this interrupted our services, of which we, are, we have even before suboptimal routine immunization coverage, and it has interrupted us, and our coverage come down because of the, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. That is how it interrupted us. It has caused a lot of stigma, and the first case which was diagnosed was a healthcare worker. That is the community stigmatize the whole hospital, the whole services, they say it's the healthcare workers who are transmitting this disease. Mm. That is how it has interrupted and affected our service delivery, especially the essential service, because we say vaccine is, is essential mm. service that can protect us or fight against any diseases, against vaccine preventable diseases. Mm. We need to strengthen in this time of pandemic our routine immunization because it will protect the key things that can protect us, prevent us from these diseases. Okay, and uh, okay. Sahara, how have you been able now to sort of get some more confidence from the communities in the health system and the healthcare workers to be able to jumpstart the routine immunization? Okay, what we did when we found that the, children, the mothers are not bringing their children and the service, all our critical services have been interrupted. We come together as a management. We discuss what is the way forward, how to demystify this 
rumors and this stigma. Then we went to our local radio community with our health promotion of SA. We talked to the community. We also strengthened advocacy, communication, and social mobilization to create awareness and telling them it is right now, it is this time, it is the right time to bring even those who have missed from immunization because immunization is the key thing that protects us against this deadly disease of uh, the virus. And we told them we continue using our prevention measure and we provide health education at all the health facility. We talk to all our health facility in charges to do the same at their level. That is how they, we talk to the community and they have come and uh, come for the service. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. And uh, Angela, clearly you can hear from Moranga County, from Wajir County, the impact of the pandemic. And mm. apart from the pandemic, I think it's important for us to talk about these routine vaccinations we keep mentioning. Yeah. What are these and why are they so important? I'll start with the last question. Why is it important? Mm -hmm. um, remember I said Gladys, prevention will always be better than cure. Mm -hmm. And in the history of mankind, the only two strategies that have had dramatic impact in reducing death and associated complications when it comes to infectious diseases, only two, nothing beats these two. The first, believe it or not, is hand washing. Uh -huh. And maybe one day we'll have a show on hand washing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the second is vaccines. Nothing beats those two. Okay, even if you look at how smallpox was eradicated, it was through vaccines. So that's why vaccinations are key. Mm -hmm. Now, what are these routine uh, vaccinations that we are talking about? Remember, I said whenever policymakers are thinking of pre uh, strategies for uh, prevention, they always think of uh, feasibility and sustainability. All right. So there's the package that we are calling the basic package. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. The first one is what we call the BCG vaccine that helps to protect uh, children against severe forms of tuberculosis. Then the second one is something we call pentavalent, penta for five, because it helps to protect against five diseases, whooping cough, tetanus, uh, polio, you know, uh, there's something called diphtheria, all right? Mm -hmm. Then the next one, it was actually introduced, uh, I think it was in 2012, if I remember well, uh, is the pneumonia vaccine, all right? That was also introduced as part of our basic uh, package. And then we also have the measles uh, vaccine that's given at nine months. The one for the pentavalent and the polio vaccine, that one is given at six weeks of age, 10 weeks of age, and 14 weeks of age. The other one that the government also introduced because of the um, mobility of, uh, associated with it, rotavirus that causes vomiting and diarrhea, again, that was introduced. So in Kenya, that is what we're calling the basic package, right? There are other extra vaccines, which I know actually the government had planned to introduce into the basic package, for example, like the meningitis vaccine. Mm -hmm. But you know, with what has happened, of course, that has affected the rollout of some of these things. So Gladys, those are the, the basic uh, vaccines that we're talking about. And just as Sahara has said, you know, in addition to the pandemic, I, I say we also in another pandemic called the fear pandemic, it's real. Mm. Yeah, you know, when you're told there's a disease that can make you collapse in a couple of hours, nobody wants to lose their lives. So the fear in the society is real. And I applaud, you know, what Sahara and her team have done, um, trying to go to the people themselves. You know, those are really fundamental principles of human-centered design. Go to the people whom you're targeting, understand their fears, mm. see how to address them, and convince them to take up these preventive strategies. Because the fear, uh, Gladys, that we, we as pediatricians, not just pediatricians, global health workers, is that the gains we have made in combating measles mm. and polio and pneumonia, we are likely to lose those gains. 
because of a pandemic because of a pandemic uh-huh yeah. and uh, ruth you mentioned that even before the pandemic the coverage in as far as routine immunization wasn't as good but uh, it has get, gotten better now <clears throat> with time what was hindering optimal vaccination in your area before the pandemic uh, during the pandemic uh, during the pandemic, we were we are not able to maybe uh, do sensitization meetings uh, like uh, barasas, which are organized by the uh, assistant county commissioners and the chiefs, uh, where we sensitize the community on uh, different issues and even the immunizations. So during this uh, pandemic, we were not able to we are not able to arrange for uh, meetings uh, and also uh, when uh, the lockdown came we people are not going to churches where we use the church as a platform where we can talk about uh, immunization and other uh, uh, health issues uh, also during this uh, pandemic um, uh, because the patients and the clients were fearing to come to the hospital because of infection uh, we normally use a platform where we do uh, patient clients health education in uh, health facilities and yeah uh, because the patients were not uh, uh, coming to the facility we were not able to sensitize many of the clients and patients uh, so that they take the message uh, back home that uh, the services for immunization are ongoing and even for other services. Okay, Ruth, even as we try to see your face on the phone because you're moving the phone too far from your face, I'd, I'd like you to just clarify something. You said that before the pandemic, the coverage of routine vaccines was also wanting. What was impeding optimal coverage? Uh, the, uh, it was below 70%, although now in Moranga County, in Gataga sub-county is uh, near Kiabu, uh, sub, uh, Kiabu County, mm -hmm. and mostly uh, we see that uh, also our clients go to Kiabu County uh, to seek services in uh, Refo 5 uh, Hospital. So sometimes we miss our clients because they go to other hospitals in uh, Kiabu uh, sub-county. Uh, because they uh, also... Uh, patients, uh, uh, mothers may not uh, may not even bring their children because mm -hmm. of religious issues. Although here mostly there are not very many uh, because there are those ones who say that uh, they cannot use uh, uh, drugs and even vaccines. But there are not very many. They are a bit few. Mostly it is about going to another county. And how about the role of tradition? Uh, in Moranga County, uh, uh, we I don't think uh, that uh, we are uh, mothers refuse to bring their mother, uh, their children to uh, the for vaccination because of traditions. Here, it is not so much uh, featured. Aha! Uh -huh. Let's hear from Wajir County, Sahara. What is the role of tradition and religion in as far as impeding routine vaccinations? Okay. To start with Roth, let me just tell, tell you the true picture in our county, that is Wajia. Yes. In 2020, out of 23,578 under one children that were eligible for immunization, only 15,236, which is 65%, were fully immunized. When I said fully immunized, uh, the children who have started this immunization, this primary immunization schedule, and finish and complete the immunization schedule. Mm -hmm. So out of the 23,578 was our target for the year 2020, we were able to vaccinate 15,236, which is 65%. We are below our, that, our coverage. We are supposed to reach... 80 and above for us to say this is an optimal coverage okay the and remaining now mm -hmm. the remaining 8342 failed to complete the vaccination schedule and this lead if you see this huge number unvaccinated and rich this led mm -hmm. to a huge immunity gap mm -hmm. among children of under five ch children for routine immunization due to the suboptimal routine immunization coverage across the country. 
Due to this low immunization, low population immunity in the county, the county has reported the outbreak of vaccine-preventable disease. Mm -hmm. A good example is measles rubella, which we are planning now to do mm -hmm. a mass vaccination. This coming God willing, June. Now, if you ask what is impending, what is making this, the remaining 8,000 children not to come for this vaccination, mm -hmm. we have a lot of challenges. You understand our community, so many communities. We are nomads. We move from one place to another. So they are hard to reach population. If you don't have service to go and reach them, like outreach services or mobile services, that is what is, that is the major thing. Another challenge is we have noted that it make us not to reach to this unvaccinated, the number I have said for last year, the, un, the remaining number, the 8,000, is one. We had a pocket of insecurity that is hindering immunization service. You have had a lot of issues in Wajia, especially in Northeastern. We had a lot of insecurity. Some of the facilities are inaccessible. We have closed some of the facilities because of insecurity and majority of our population. Those who are targeted, we are targeting under one year, they are there. Then another important thing, we said generally we have access and utilization problem. When we say access and utilization problem, what do we mean by that? Access is this population you are targeting. Your catchment population, they are not accessing these services. What could be the contributing factors? One, I have already said these are normal population. They are hard to reach and the distance from the facility is far. They cannot afford understanding their economical status. They cannot afford to travel and they don't even understand because of the illiteracy level, the importance of coming for this vaccination. Then the other thing, when I talk of uh, utilization, utilization problem, what do I mean? We have high dropout. Mm. Why? High dropout or because of the community. They don't understand this importance of this vaccination. Once this child access these services for the first time, maybe this mother does not understand even when to come back and the health worker who is on the, on the ground does not even allow, mm. does not even tell this mother when to come back. Okay. Then, mm -hmm. Yes. I think we can stop at that point and we'll look at more of these circumstances that actually impede full coverage, especially of routine immunization. And speaking of which, negative stereotypes and a retrogressive culture in some parts of this country has also been said to be an impeding factor to uptake of uh, routine immunization. And this has been seen over and over again. And actually a report by the Kenya AIDS NGOs Consortium, Kanko, revealed that immunization uptake is very low in communities with lower literacy levels. During a sensitization workshop for county assemblies members in Transoia, the organization urged the county to improve its tracking mechanisms on children and parents within the region to build a safe nation. Vaccination in Transoia County stands at 67% against the national percentage, which stands at 90%. Uh, stereotyping myths and misconception is uh, rampant across the county and across the nation and uh, it is very important that we work together with uh, the multi-stakeholder approach to ensure that this uh, is sorted. First of all we've been working with the religious leaders uh, who have uh, their congregation so that they can talk to their members and clarify these issues. They have been able to go through a challenge like infrastructure where we do not have enough facility to provide the service of immunization. Also, they have a challenge on policy because they have been also, we need to mobilize, to, they, 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 they need to have a mobilization strategy on how mothers, whether delivered in the facility or whether delivered in the facility, can be mobilized to move to the facility to get the children, children to get vaccination.
So, Angela, let's talk about the disruptors. These disruptors, yeah. apart from the COVID-19 disruptions, <laughs> the disruptors have always been with us. Yes. There has been talk of re religion, culture, yeah. Yeah. illiteracy, yeah. among others. Yeah. Talk about how this is so important to be looked into and mm. also perhaps find ways mm. to penetrate the communities. So, there was some interesting work done by um, Mashari and colleagues at the Kenya Medical Research Institute. Actually, they published their paper last year. Mm -hmm. And they're looking at some of the factors that um, impact on the uptake of um, vaccinations. Actually, they're looking at childhood vaccinations mm -hmm. um, in that paper. And what they found on average across the country, for example, um, it if you were working, it takes about 63 minutes to walk to the closest vaccination center. That's an hour plus. An hour plus. Uh -huh. uh, if you are driving on average about 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. But what struck me in that paper, they said that should the time between where you are to the vaccination center be two hours or more, they found that the rate of children that potentially could be vaccinated would drop down by 50%. Look at that, just the impact of distance. So infrastructure. In, thank you. Infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Remember I said we exist in a health ecosystem, yes. you know? Mm -hmm. So it's one thing about the distance. And then the other thing also is um, the culture of the people at that vaccination center. You know, Gladys, if you go to a center and people are screaming at you, they are harsh, you're not even clear where you're going, that can put you off, you know? But if you go to a, a center where people are warm, they're welcoming, again, that can help you, you know? So I think the onus is on us in our different health facilities to look at also the culture within our health facilities. Is it the kind of culture that will draw on people? Is it the kind of culture that would push people mm -hmm. away? Then the other thing still linked to infrastructure is the issue of um, stocks of this of these vaccines because that is can you imagine if you walk two hours to a, a facility and you're told we've run out of the vaccines you know that would discourage you i know in our country that might not be such a big issue but you know when you're looking at it from a global perspective those are things that would impact and then also don't forget so that's looking at the you know health ecosystems in that say you know infrastructure and then let's not forget the individuals okay there are child factors, all right? There are some conditions, Gladys, and maybe that can be a topic for another day, where children are born and already their inborn defense system, their inborn immune system mm -hmm. is already weak. So if you give them a vaccine, that makes them terribly sick. And then because maybe the guardians don't know, they say, no, our children only take them for vaccines, they become very sick, we are not taking them anymore. Uh -huh. So those are the conditions we call primary immunodeficiencies, and that can be a topic for another day. So there are some children, just by the virtue of how they are born, they're not able to tolerate vaccines well, and the guardians don't know, right? Mm -hmm. The other children, uh, Gladys, you know, who have been treated for things like cancer, like for me, I treat children with arthritis, so sometimes the kind of medications we give would hamper them from getting the vaccines, all right? Mm -hmm. So those are children factors. Then we come to the parental factors. And the parental factors, and I like what Sahara has said, uh, about education. You know, sometimes when you're looking at a system, you're looking for leverage points where if you made a change there, it would have an exponential impact in another aspect mm -hmm. of your system. So, you know, I, I echo our sentiments that education is one area that if we're able to focus on it, and do it well, whether it's through the um, community barrazas um, or other educational platforms, that can have an exponential effect in increasing how parents actually take their children for the vaccines. And like again, I, as I said earlier, um, let's not hide from the economic impact of this pandemic. Yeah. That again would impact. I mean, if you're going to need to travel and you need to pay some money for a vehicle, and you're not sure that you'll eat at night, what are you going to do, Gladys? Mm -hmm. You'd rather eat at night and see how to deal with vaccinations later. Poverty plays a part. Yeah. Okay, and uh, it's interesting that we say in different parts of the country there has been hindrance of a certain magnitude. And uh, let me go back to Ruth. We've had from Sahara the impact of not taking up or following through with uh, routine uh, immunization. What has been the health impact in your region that you've seen?
Ruth? Hello. Yes. The impact is because, uh, like now, economically, the mothers have been uh, down. Uh, those who are uh, casual laborers in uh, in Gatanga, they work in flower farms. They were uh, not able. To, uh, they they they, are, they were not working, and uh, so economically they were not having money in their pockets. And okay, so Ruth, we cannot the... see your face. Please tilt your phone. There you go. All right, let's go. Uh huh. Uh, so economically they don't have money. So from their homes to the health facilities. Mm -hmm. Maybe they will uh, not get money to come to the clinics, and so uh, they miss the, uh, the to bring their children to for immunizations. Okay, and what has been the health yeah. impact you have seen? What are some of uh, the diseases that have reemerged in the community due to this? Uh, in the community, mm -hmm. uh, what has uh, reemerged is like uh, we have been getting cases of uh, measles because maybe uh, those children who are nine years, uh, the mothers uh, have been uh, have failed to bring them to the clinic, although they are not very many, uh, because I said that uh, during the pandemic the the immunization coverage had gone to below eighty; it was around seventy something. But uh, after maybe towards the end of the year we achieved around 95 percent so there are not very many cases it is like uh, cases of uh, measles mm -hmm. maybe even uh, cases of pneumonia uh, because they are those who had missed the pentafarent uh, those children who are uh, they were not they were not given uh, the pentafarent for six uh, six weeks 10 mm -hmm. and 14 weeks Okay, and uh, the reason why I'm asking this, Dactarian, when we come back from the break, I'd like you to address the same, is the impact of missing out on this routine immunization that has even been highlighted by the World Health Organization, especially um, within a pandemic. But for us, it has also been something that was there even before the pandemic. So we'll cover that in a moment. But before we do that, let's take a look at some of your feedback, even as we asked you that question, what needs to be done to ensure undisrupted co coverage of life-saving vaccination or immunization? That hashtag is new normal. If you can have this feedback, back on screen we have eddie simply the government should just eliminate corruption on such key ministries eddie we hear you another here from max elmer who says i think this vaccine is what caused the double mutation in india this vaccine is not helpful at all we have a lot of faith max i think your thoughts have been addressed by dr in as far as how people look at these uh, things dr reth cheer i think have have a non-profit NGO manage the process in a transparent manner instead of allowing corrupt national organizations to make, uh, you know, of it by stealing or selling or embezzling. We hear you, Dr. Terry. We have Philiam who is uh, asking, why is there no cancer vaccine? Good question. Dr. Terry will be letting us know in a moment. And Kamau Kim says, truth be told, the vaccine supply is low. And this has been alluded to. Well, we take a short break on your world when we come back we understand what the possible impacts are of missing out on these routine vaccinations in a moment Kwetu Mix in association with Coca-Cola. Introducing Kwetu Mix. Okay, but don't need no intro. Tangu tungye kwe mchezo sindo heartbeat. Nairobi City to Nairan kama heartbeat. Hey, if you know, you know. We have a bang. Another bang. This show, ni wapi uli niona. Kwetu Mix on MTV. Hapa, hapo tu, hapo tu. Tutakulete update zote about all the trendy and popular entertainment events. Yeah. Yes, man. Kwetu Mix. Keep it locked. NTV. Don't touch the dial. Kwetu Mix in association with Coca Cola. Yeah. 
It was founded 46 years ago and it is the largest circle in coast region. Imarika Circle members have gone up from 100 to 100,000. As at 31st March 2021, our total assets stood at 9.7 billion Kenya shillings. We took 6 million so that we can have a place for theatre. The future of our economy will rest on how well cooperatives are grounded. Imarika Circle, this Tuesday at 6.45 p.m. Sisi kama kogalo team, saa hii game yetu imeenda class. Tunataka players wetu wapewe koti. Yama na mna gani? Suit, suit, suit. Wapewe suti. Daxido. Wa, Daxido. Hey. Ivo, Ivo. Mm. Goalkeeper kwanza tunataka fridge weke pale kando. Sofa set. Double door. Mm. Tunataka kishika ball, anaenda kwa fridge, anachukwe. Anasika ball gani ya wakujangi kufunga, wanakuwa mesinda huko goalkeeper. To get kogalo, dial star, 811 star 850 hash Skiza na Nation Try Panadol Advance for relief from headaches, body aches, and fever. With Panadol's Optizob formula, the tablet gently breaks down in the stomach, quickly absorbs, and starts providing pain relief in 15 minutes. For fast and effective pain relief that you can trust, try Panadol Advance. <laughs> Thank you for staying with your world. My name is Gladys Kashanja. Today we are literally having a vaccination immunization one on one conversation and helping us along is Dr. Angela Migua, who is a rheumatologist. We are also joined by Ruth Wambo, who is a health pro promotion officer, joining us from Moranga County, and Sahara Ado, who is the expanded program of immunization focal point at Wajir County. Ladies, thank you for staying with us. And Dr. Tari, before we went to break, we yeah. were talking about the possible impact of not following through with routine immunization that mm. has been highlighted mm. by even the WHO. Yeah. Speak about some of these impacts. So what I can tell you that we have observed at the Aga Khan uh, University Hospital, uh, we had an upsurge um, of children with very severe pneumonia. And these are children when we were testing them, they were negative for COVID. So like I said, you know, we don't have the privilege of time to know what's going to be the long-term impact, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but I can tell you for free, we saw many cases of severe pneumonia. That one I can tell you. And remember that concept we discussed in the beginning yes. of herd immunity, mm -hmm. where you want to protect a critical number of people so that those who are very vulnerable are shielded, yeah. yeah. That's why, you know, vaccination matters. It's not a matter of just you and me, Gladys. It's me making sure that I do my best to protect you. Mm -hmm. And I think if there's a lesson as mankind we need to learn in this pandemic, is that we are interconnected. You know, and I'll say it out of humility, you know, when I first heard about this new disease in Wuhan, China, I said, my gosh, what's happening there? Well, anyway, I'm sure they'll sort it out. Mm -hmm. Before you know it, we are dealing with the same issue. So we are, inter I think it's really important for people to realize as a human race, we are interconnected and therefore we have like a moral obligation to do our best, yeah, to make sure we help safeguard everyone, all right? Um, so we saw definitely an upsurge of very severe pneumonia cases. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we noticed, Gladys, you see, at the vaccination visit, Gladys, it's not just a matter of your child comes and they're injected or if it's polio, you go in my mouth and you go. Mm -mm. There's normally like a health check that's happening. 
All right. I recall a case a couple of months ago. This is a child um, who delayed to come for measles. You know, measles vaccine in our country is given at nine months. So because of the pandemic and because of fear, this child came at one year. And this child came because the child developed a rash and the mom wasn't sure whether this is now measles or not. It wasn't measles, but something else we noticed which was of our concern is that actually the nurse is the one who picked it. This is why it's good to work with the team. The nurse is the one who picked it and she came to my uh, office and said, you know, Doc, there's a child who's come for measles, but something about the size of the head makes me uncomfortable. I said, okay, I'll have a look. And when we had a look, for sure, the child had what we call hydrocephalus, you know, where fluid accumulates in the brain and then the child could have a large head. Mm -hmm. And mom said that this uh, started about two, three uh, months back, just around the time when this child was due for the measles vaccine. So, you know, it's not just a matter of coming for the injection. There's a health check that actually happens consciously or subconsciously as children are being vaccinated and certain conditions which we could have picked early mm -hmm. and mitigated against them early they're now coming coming late uh -huh. you know and those are some of the challenges we are facing when um you know people are not getting a chance to be compliant with vaccines i want to respond to one of the comments that was put there why is there no vaccine for cancer uh -huh. you know the word cancer is such a heterogeneous, but well, not say heterogeneous, general term. It's like saying infection. You know, the main infections, right? Okay. Malaria infection, typhoid infection, you know. Um, it's the same thing with cancer. There are many different types of cancers. Remember, I said vaccines is expensive business. Mm -hmm. So they always try to see where can we intervene to have maximum impact. So we do have a vaccine that actually helps prevent against cervical cancer. Yes. And that's the human papilloma virus vaccine. Again, uptake for that um, hasn't been as optimum as we would have hoped. Uh, but I think we still need to do much more work to understand what are the community's fears and concerns, mm -hmm. address them, give them the pros and the cons of the vaccine so that they can make an informed decision. That's a good place to actually go to Sahara and understand mm -hmm. how the population in Wajir County has been taking up the HPV vaccine. Remember, this was introduced in the country in 2019 and it is actually administered on a 10-year-old girl. So, Sahara, how has the community been taking this up? Are parents taking their children for this uh, vaccine? Okay, this has been a challenge. If we come to HPV, this is one of the major challenges we have in our county. Mm -hmm. The uptake is very, very, very low. Since the introduction, October, it was introduced October 2019. Mm -hmm. The uptake is very low. There is a negative perception for them, the community because they relate these vaccines when they had this is a vaccine that protects these girls or women against the cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. One of the frequently asked questions, why are we targeting 10 years old girls only and not boys and not other age group? That was a major concern from our community. The uptake is very low. We are planning to do a lot of advocacy, communicates from the grassroots to the community. We need to educate our community, but generally from Wajia, the uptake for HPV vaccine is very, very low. Sahara, why is it so low? You say they wonder why 10-year-olds. Why do you, they think this is the case? Yeah. The major concern from the community, they say that maybe they associate this thing with family planning. They said once you are targeting only girls mm -hmm. and not male and again 10 years girls there is a hidden agenda that is what they that is their perception mm -hmm. from the community then another thing is they said why only under 10 why 10 years and not others but mm -hmm. we have tried to address their concern mm -hmm. still the uptake is very very low okay let's hear from uh, moranga county ruth 
Uh, I think yes. we do not have Ruth for now. Do we have her? Do we have her picture? Yes. Okay, she can hear me. Ruth, what and how has been the uptake of the HPV vaccine in Moranga County? The HPV vaccine mm -hmm. uh, for the 10-year-old girls, uh, we were vaccinating like uh, 2,000 and something. I, I can give the data for Wataka sub-county. Mm. I might not be having the data for the whole county. And uh, in Muranga County, uh, we had given uh, almost 1,700, but uh, after the lockdown, the registers for the HPV vaccines were in schools. So after the schools were, were closed, we were not able to reach the, the girls, but uh, we decided to do some uh, sensitizations, uh, riding on all other uh, 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 programs for the COVID-19, where we were doing sensitization of COVID-19. We went uh, with roadshows uh, when doing the sensitization for COVID-19, saying that uh, we were still giving the 10-year-old girls uh, the HPV vaccine, although we were not able to reach all of them because the, the platforms that we use, mm -hmm. uh, like the church, like the schools, uh, like the barasas, uh, we could not, uh, uh, we were not able to uh, to get those platforms. Okay, now before the pandemic, seeing that uh, the vaccine was introduced in 2019, was there any hesitancy in the population about uh, being vaccinated? Yes. Uh, the the population or the, uh, the, the guardians uh, were asking why the 10-year-old girls uh, were being given and uh, some of them uh, felt that uh, uh, they did not understand why uh, the 10 year old girls were uh, to be given but uh, uh, we did some say before the before uh, the covid 19 uh, we did some sensitization starting with the teachers mm -hmm. uh, we also did the stakeholders uh, which uh, the stakeholders forums includes the uh, the opinion readers mm -hmm. uh, the uh, the teachers, uh, the religious readers, mm -hmm. uh, whereby we had uh, at least to, uh, to sensitize them why we were giving the 10-year-old girls it is to prevent uh, the cervical cancer. Okay, now Dr. Migo, I mean you can hear it. Clearly information is power. So inform yeah. us, why is this critical mm -hmm. for us to actually vaccinate 10-year-olds with the HPV vaccine? Let's go back to some of the introductory um, facts that we discussed, mm -hmm. right? Is that um, we all have our inborn defense system, the immune system. And, you know, think of your immune system like the KDF, you know, Kenya Defense Forces, you know. They, they're always in training, isn't it, mm -hmm. to protect this country um, from any assault or attack. And it's the same thing with our immune system. All right. Um, we need to provide a platform for our immune system to be able to train and be ready in the event we ever face an attack by all these germs that cause infection or cancer. Mm -hmm. And for the HPV vaccine, all right, the key period or critical window period is to vaccinate people before their sexual debut. Because this is a virus that's transmitted sexually. So you want to train the army, the inborn defense system of these people way before they even conceptualize or, or think of engaging in their sexual debut. Why girls versus boys? Because we know that the human papilloma virus vaccine has caused more deaths due to cervical cancer mm -hmm. as opposed to deaths due to penile cancer in the men. But even when you engage with the ministry uh, people, it's not that they are locking out the boys. You know, these things, is, is, it's, a, it's a rollout, phased rollout, just like the COVID vaccine, right? They started with those who are high risk, 
healthcare workers and then the you know the teachers and then then they roll it out to include the elderly and then the next thing you know it's going to be rolled out to everybody else because remember they have to think of things that are sustainable and feasible mm -hmm. yeah so it was not just exclusively for girls only no it's just the rollout phase that eventually i know those were things that they had in, in, in mind to eventually to incorporate. So that's why that window period is very key, uh, Gladys. You want them to have their immune system ready, equipped in the event they are exposed, they have the capacity to fight it off. Uh -huh. yeah. There you have your answer why it is yeah. that it is 10 year olds that yeah. needs to be vaccinated against cervical cancer. And of course, remember, cervical cancer is a leading cause of female cancer deaths in this country, as Dr. Migoa is mentioning. And uh, now that we've talked about various vaccines that are in this country that are available, there's another against malaria that was approved in 2019 and rolled out, and it has proved to be 77 percent effective raising hopes that one of the world's most deadly diseases could be brought under control malaria kills more than 400,000 people a year mostly children in sub-saharan africa now developed by oxford university the vaccine is the first to meet the World Health Organization's Malaria Vaccine Technology Roadmap goal of a malaria vaccine with at least 75% efficacy. A trial was done on 450 children in Burkina Faso and the vaccine was found to be safe and showed high level efficacy over 12 months of follow-up. Now to assess large-scale safety and efficacy, a trial in 4,800 children aged 5 to 36 months across four African countries will be done. Now the university hopes to be able to manufacture at least 200 million doses annually and malaria is a life-threatening disease caused by parasites that are transmitted to people through mosquito bites. This is another vaccine that has come to really help us along, especially yeah. with the burden <coughs> of malaria. How yeah. are we doing in that front? Of course, it has been found to be, yeah. you know, uh, efficient. But yeah. how are we doing with the uptake from where you sit? Um, I think, um, I'll be honest, Delis, I do not have any data mm -hmm. right now mm -hmm. about the uptake of the malaria vaccine. Um, it's definitely going to be a game changer. Um, because we still have significant numbers of children and pregnant moms who are really suffering severe forms of this disease. Um, and I think the jury is still out there, Gladys, mm. as to how well it will be taken up and what will be the community's perception um, of it. And again, you know, because there's always a talk of the side effects, yes. what will be the impact of the both perceived and actual side effects regarding the uptake of this vaccine. Uh -huh. Yes, I think we should watch this space. Okay. <laughs> All right. At this point, we take another short break on Your World. When we come back, we talk more about vaccines. Remember, it's not only for children. We also have vaccines that you as an adult can actually walk into a hospital and ask that you have these germs because they go a long way in safeguarding you against disease. We'll talk more about those in a moment. Stay with us. Bosses who changed the office entirely in order to create the most comfortable workspace. And to everyone who brings Bureau Time to them in over 50 countries. Bureau Time. Asset for success. If there's one thing that all soaps do, it's wash. From buckets to basins, bathrooms to streams, and everything in between. 
all soap wash. Yes, but Protex is different. It's reinvented formula with flaxseed oil. Boosts your skin's natural anti-germ defenses by 10 times more, protecting you against 99.9% .9 of germs. So what keeps us healthy? Protex. Protex. Good health starts here. about Molfix. Actually, another brand was recommended to me, but it had a leakage problem. Then I decided to try Molfix. His clothes don't get wet anymore. Because Molfix provides extra protection against leakage thanks to its anti-leakage elastic barriers. All babies deserve a high-quality diaper. You should also try Molfix. Salad vegetable cooking oil is the clear flowing secret to tasty meals. Buy 5 liters of salad vegetable cooking oil today and get 250 grams Zesta tomato sauce for free. Iflo Kama Salad. Salad vegetable cooking oil. Available in all cooking outlets countrywide. The World Athletics Under-20 Athletes are the next big names in sports. It's astonishing. Be part of their growing pains and glory in wins. One of the great Olympic moments. A new world record! It's been obliterated! Witness greatness in the making live on NTV. And a fantastic finish. Setting the pace for the nation. Hello. Hello, my love. Excuse me, I just have to take. Go this. ahead. Oh, what do you want, Blanca? I want you to hear my voice so that you won't forget me, darling. You are now in jail, Blanca, and you will never get out of there. Don't be too sure, my love. There's nothing impossible for me. Josefina Alvarez, formerly Monterubio, is the one who killed Mr. Rafael Gutierrez. Timeless love. Beat sensitivity pain fast with Sensodyne Rapid Action for clinically proven relief in 60 seconds. Panadol Advance for relief from headaches, body aches, and fever. With Panadol's Optizorb formula, the tablet gently breaks down in the stomach, quickly absorbs, and starts providing pain relief in 15 minutes. For fast and effective pain relief that you can trust, try Panadol Advance. Thank you for staying with your world. My name is Gladys Gashanja. Of course, today we are focusing on vaccination awareness. But before we get back to that conversation, let's take a look at your other world. Now, a Malian woman gave birth to nonuplets in Morocco and her nine babies are being treated in incubators because of their weight. Such a case of multiple births is extremely rare and it's exceptional, said the medical director of the Ein Boha Clinic in the city of Casablanca. The verified world record for the most living births is eight born to an American woman, Nadia Suleiman, nicknamed Octomom in 2009 when she was 33. Doctors say the 25-year-old Malian mother Halima Sise is doing well.
Wow. Happy Mother's Day to her times nine. Wow. Now, a rising number of Malaysian cat lovers are dressing up their house pets with traditional outfits as the country prepares to usher in the Muslim holiday of Eid. Tailored by hand, the feline-sized traditional ethnic Malay outfits are designed by pet product and fashions company Miao Ku Trading with dresses sporting wider collars in proportion to humans for cat heads to fit through. For us, the cat is a part of our family as well. So that is why we also want the cat to have the same uh, team color uh, of the baju raya with us. We ensure that the cat uh, loves the materials and feel comfortable when they wear it. So actually, our material is the premium one, which is, is actually the materials for uh, humans uh, to use. Tips for the first time owner, uh, cat owner, which is uh, the cat is not familiar to wear clothes. Uh, so first thing you make, you have to make sure is to make sure the cat is relaxed and uh, they are happy and calm them down before you put the clothes on them. Oh yeah, definitely bound to bring a smile to cat lovers. Now, still on fashion, black artists are represented like never before at New York Spring Sales next week after years of being overlooked and underappreciated with several expected to set new records for their works. This year's prestigious auctions will feature many black artists. I like to think of it as a correction. Um, and I think for a long time the work was overlooked, but the work has always been actually fantastic for decades. Um, and I think the recent um, appreciation of that work actually started before the reckoning last summer, but I think some of that did add to it. The conversation with everything that happened last year was already in my work, so anyone who does a, any survey of my, the last 20 years of my production can see that I've been speaking about these issues for a long time because all these issues have been around for a very long time. Um, but now because there is such increased um, attention uh, towards the issues, hopefully there will be some resolution. Recalibration in the market um, for works by generally just underrepresented artists over the past hundred years whether it's artists of color, female artists, artists who traditionally by the nature of the mainstream art world have been marginalized. I think in the past several years there's been a, um, a focus and a real effort to rewrite or reposition the mainstream discourse of 20th century art history. They want to collect art that really is reflective of our times. And I think the art that is being made today by these artists are reflective of our times. They want to push forward conversations that might have been uncomfortable. And, and a lot of this art, which is quite representational, because a lot of the art that's being made today is highly figurative and representational, and there is a narrative component to it. Well, back to a discussion this morning. Well, two weeks ago, the world marked the vaccination week, which aims to promote the use of vaccines to protect people of all ages against disease. And that's why this morning we'll like to just take time or we've been taking time to just understand why vaccines are so important. Important in safeguarding disease. We still have Dr. Angela Migoa with us in studio. We have Sahara joining us from uh, Wajir County and of course Ruth who is joining us from Muranga County. And I'd like to hear from uh, Ruth when you think about the impediments you were talking about, whether uh, caused by the pandemic or due to other disruptions that have always been there in as far as uh, optimal uptake of routine immunization is concerned, which have been the success factors factors that you've been riding on? Is it uh, the elders? Is it the religious leaders? What are these factors that you always know when you use these, you know, uh, people in the community, you'll always get the positivity rate you want? Uh, in health promotion, we normally uh, use uh, some platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, we use uh, the religious leaders whereby uh, they are able to communicate 
uh, about immunization and even other health issues. And when people, when the religious leaders uh, communicate these messages about immunization, about any other health issues, uh, the, the church or the members are able to accept if there are vaccines or anything else. Uh, to do with the health issues. We also use uh, uh, the stakeholders, different types of stakeholders. We can use uh, the social development department, which deals with the uh, social groups, and uh, we uh, identify the groups, and then we go and give uh, messages, on. we help educate them on the issues uh, that uh, uh, we want to uh, uh, adhere to. Uh, by the community. We also uh, use uh, the CHVs. The CHVs are attached to our facilities. Every facility is attached to uh, some, uh, they have um, a community unit which, mm -hmm. which has got at least, a community unit has got at least uh, 20 CHVs. And these CHVs, we educate them, and then they are allocated some uh, households and they are able to uh, go to the households and communicate uh, these messages. May it be the messages for like the HPV vaccine for the 10 year old girls. We have been using them uh, to identify those households with the 10 year old girls so that uh, they come for the vaccination. Okay, and uh, there's somebody who is asking, especially when it comes to these boosters, we are always seeing, for example, polio. Every other time, there's a polio vaccination drive. Do you get such questions as to why this happens so many times? Yes, we do. The time we used to, I think it was in 2017, 2018, mm -hmm. we used to give uh, so many uh, Polio, we used to do so many polio campaigns and uh, the community always ask why uh, we keep on uh, giving the polio vaccination but uh, we give health messages and uh, we sensitize them that uh, the many times that you give the polio, the polio uh, vaccine you are able to protect these children from getting the polio maritis. Uh, so mm -hmm. we sensitize them so that they understand and so that they accept uh, the vaccine. Okay, now Sahara, you deal with the community that are pastoralists. So one season they're in this place, another season they've moved to another place. How are you able to ensure there's adherence, especially to these routine immunizations and as the booster shots, especially for conditions like polio? Okay, how we deal with the nomad population, which is the majority of our community, mm. our population is we reach to them through, we have developed so many strategies. The first strategy is where there is a fixed facility to offer these immunization services. We can reach to them through health education. By talking to them on the importance of immunization, they can access the facility. Another strategy is those who are far from where the facility is, they could not come for the service. We reach to them through outreach services which is supported by the partners especially save the children who is now supporting us in reaching to them through the uh, outreach services then another important key strategy we use to reach our target is we need to strengthen our advocacy communication social mobilization why is it important to do that to strengthen advocacy, communication, and social mobilization. It will help us to improve our immunization coverage. It will also empower, as I said, we have high level of illiteracy among our community, especially women. Mm. So if we strengthen our advocacy, communication, and the communication and mobilize, social mobilization, it will help us to empower these parents, educate them on the benefits of this immunization so that they will come for these services. Then another important thing on advocacy again is to engage our policy makers and decision makers on to mobilize for political and resource mobilization. So once they allocate a lot of resource to EPI program, it will help us to reach our, our target, to reach to improve our coverage.
Another important strategy is we also, as Ruth said, we also mobilize, use our CHVs at the community level to go to house to house, visit and mobilize this community, create awareness. Maybe some of them, they are not even aware whether this service is mm -hmm. available at the facility where they stay. Then another important strategy is linking with any services in the facility, linking with the community, and also engaging the key stakeholders who will support you on the immunization implementation. Okay. All I right. That is All right. <laughs> and considering that uh, your community is also heavily patriarchal and uh, led by the men, do you also strategically use them to help you, you know, disseminate the information to the rest of the community? Exactly. Thank you for reminding me that one of the challenges we have, as you say, main dominance in decision making on reproductive health. When I say reproductive health services, immunization is part of reproductive health services. Yes. So it is also good. We also involve the men, the male partners, and educating them the importance of this immunization mm -hmm. because they understand importance. Why do if they understand why we vaccinate? Mm -hmm. why we want to do what is best for our children and you know about and they know about the importance of some of them they know about the importance of the cassettes or baby kids little did they know that the best way to protect their children is for them to get all immunization or all vaccination completed so it is good we also involve both the male and female and tell them on importance of this vaccination Interesting perspectives there from both ladies. And uh, just as I said, just two weeks ago, the world marked the Immunization Week 2021. And one of the objectives was to increase trust and confidence in vaccines to maintain or increase vaccine acceptance. Just listening to the ladies, what else needs to be done in this country? Because we've got unique attributes as an African nation. <laughs> Gladys, I like that you touched on the concept and principle of trust. Um, a lot has been done to cultivate trust between um, healthcare providers and clients, healthcare institutions and clients, but a lot more needs to be done. Um, and one of the ways to help promote or um, avail vaccinations mm -hmm. Um, I think one is to come up with a very robust social health care system. Because if we are able to come up with a, a sustainable strategy for that, Gladys, that is going to definitely be a game changer. Why? But it's not going to be a matter of how much money you have in your pocket to be able to access these vaccines. Remember already the vaccines are free. The government has done a super job in making sure that those basic vaccines are free. But like we discussed earlier, you know, if the mother has to travel for two hours, there's a cost to that, mm -hmm. isn't it, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes, you know, you might be told, you, oh, you have to pay for the registration book. There's a cost to that, isn't it, mm -hmm. yeah? I don't know, maybe they might be asked to pay for the gloves and, it, you know. So there's a cost to that. So if we can come up with a system whereby we decentralize um, the centers that can actually uh, give vaccines, bring them closer to the people so that we cannot say that now distance is a hindrance, mm -hmm. number one. Two, come up with a robust social health care system. Because, you know, we are interlinked. Eh? If you have a child who is suffering from diabetes or cancer, and you do not have a, 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 a good cover, as a parent, all your efforts will go towards that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And you'll forget the six-month-old or the nine-month-old who needs the vaccines because this one has a life-threatening disease and you're trying to do your best, mm -hmm. you understand? So having that uh, robust social health care system, you know, um, can help mitigate against competing interests, you know? And um, so the issues of corruption then ultimately would come in, you know, that we, we do our best to t 
tighten those bolts, seal those loopholes, so that the resources that are meant for children in this particular region duly go to fulfill uh, that purpose. And I think the other really important thing, uh, Gladys, and I think as has been echoed by our sisters, um, is education, education, and advocacy. Mm-hmm. Because I'm an academician, another thing that I think is important is research. That we are able to have resources to even, you know, delve into, find out why, do, why does a community mistrust us so much? Why does the community not trust these vaccinations, right? So to be able to have frameworks and infrastructure in place to support research, to find homegrown solutions Mm -hmm. to our problems. And these solutions can be cascaded and have a ripple effect to benefit other people. Because like I said earlier, we are interconnected. Very well said. Now, there is a question that has been posed to you, if we can have it on screen in Mm -hmm. as far as uh, vaccination and immunization is concerned. Do we have the question? All right, a question here from Wangari who yeah. says, is there any value add for women of children of childbearing age mm-hmm. taking HPV vaccine, for example, those in their 20s and 30s or above, Daktari? So Wangari, thank you for your question. Um, to the best of my knowledge, what I know is that the human papilloma vaccine should be given before your sexual debut. That is what is known. Um, I'll be honest, I'll have to check up and see if there's any more evidence to support giving the vaccine after the sexual debut. Okay, though there has been reports that you can actually go and take one if you want to. Yes, but now the efficacy of, you know, Gladys, (laughs) there's some things, I guess we're always asking ourselves, Gladys, right? If I take this action, do the benefits outweigh the risks? Uh That is what we are always asking ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Because if it's not going to give you added protection as it should, if you got it before, would I still expose you to it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what I'm saying. I think a a thorough literature review would be required before we can make a blanket statement, general recommendation that it is okay, go ahead. Fair enough. Yeah, now, yeah. to some other questions that yeah. have been posed to you. Mm-hmm. We talked about boosters when mm. we were talking to Sahara and, uh, <clears throat> and to Ruth. And the question is, how come some conditions have yeah. boosters? You know, yes. like polio, they're always at your door knocking yes. to ensure your children yeah. take uh, the vaccine. Yet others, you take one time in your life and that's it. <laughs> um, let's go back again to some of the things we discussed yeah. earlier. You know, and I draw a lot of parallels with defense forces yeah, when it comes to the immune system. Yeah. For example, if you look at the state of Israel, why, is it, why does it have one of the best anti-terror units, Gladys? Mm-hmm. Because they are constantly being exposed to terror and danger. So they have developed mechanisms, right, to combat that. Let's come closer home, you and me. I think it's been a while since I attended an algebra class. So if you took me to an algebra <laughs> class now, <laughs> my memory is not as good. All right? Yes. Your inborn defense system, the immune system, is something similar. It has a memory. To keep that memory alert, fresh, on point, ready to protect you in the face of combat, that's where boosters come in. Right? Mm-hmm. Because it helps to stimulate your memory. Now, the polio story is interesting because, you know, like I said, the, the, the morbidity, disability with polio, yeah? Is, is, is really devastating. So you find globally, they're always doing surveillance. If they hear an outbreak, they do a surveillance mm-hmm. to see the virus causing polio, is it covered by the vaccine we are giving, right? And if not, do we need to boost? So when they're giving the boosters, it's two-pronged. Mm-hmm. One, they might have discovered another variant, all right? And they want the memory of our children's defense system to be ready robust uh-huh. to respond all right because they're doing surveillance so if they found that it is <coughs> strain number 10 and yet the vaccine covered everything from strain number one to nine then they have to boost all right does that explain mm-hmm. then why last year africa yes. de- was declared free of wild polio 
But in a few weeks, we'll see another <laughs> round of polio yes. vaccine campaign. Yes. Because of a different strain? Different strains. Okay. Different strains, you know. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't take away the fact that your defense system has some memory. What we are trying to do is to boost that memory. All right. So the vaccination that the child got before is not in vain. It's not all lost. We're just trying to sharpen that defense system to be ready for combat mm -hmm. in case it meets these bugs causing all these problems. All right. Now, let's go mm. back to the CAPI schedule, yes. which uh, is what we actually uh, have in this country yes. as far as the routine immunization for children. Yes. Now, it goes up until two years plus. There are some people who get yeah. fatigue <laughs> that two years they let go of going for this uh, immunization. Yeah. Is that a bad thing? <laughs> so... What is recommended as regards completion of the basic vaccines, uh -huh. all right? Because of the various um, factors at play, you know, our country is diverse, all right? Um, what is recommended is that the children should receive their vaccines until nine months. That's what marks completion, uh -huh. all right? Completion. But if you understand how the immune system works, that the memory is important, to sharpen your response yeah, in the event you mm -hmm. face these germs. The Ministry of Health has made it possible for these children to still receive boosters yeah, you know, until 18 months. In the private sector, for example, they have even added other vaccines mm -hmm. that are available at two years, all right, um, way past even two years. And then there's also something that's very interesting that happens, Gladys, at five years. We call it like the exit vaccines. Mm -hmm whereby you get like the last booster, all right, of the, some of the vaccines you got at the very beginning, mm -hmm. all with that principal concept to sharpen the memory of your defense system because we know the highest mortalities are in those who are under five. That's why you see this emphasis there. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And uh, we have another final question okay. here. We've said that uh, the risks when it comes to vaccines yeah. actually, actually the benefits outweigh the risks. Mm -hmm. However, there are those who, uh, somebody who is asking, we had mm. a case of paralysis in mm. Western Kenya a few mm. years ago mm -hmm. when children took up the polio vaccine. How yeah. do you explain such a scenario? Yeah. So... Gladys, like I said um, earlier, there's no vaccine without side effects. All of them have side effects. And when they are doing the vaccine trials, those are the things that are, they are mandated to report. What are the common side effects? Not so common or rare mm -hmm. side effects. And actually the mandate is on us as the healthcare workers when uh, guardians or parents come uh, to the clinic, right, to share this information with them so that you know that when I'm taking this vaccine, this is a potential risk. But then, like I said earlier, do the risks, do the benefits outweigh? The risks. The risk. So, like, like I give the example, if I want to cross the road, Gladys, I remember when we were in nursery, you would be told, look right, look left, look right again. And when that road is clear, cross. But it doesn't mean that someone on a motorcycle won't come out of the corner out of nowhere and potentially put me at risk of being knocked. Mm -hmm. But I take the calculated decision to cross over. So it's similar with the vaccines. So as regards that particular case, I'm not aware of all the particulars and details that um, are attributed to that particular child who got the paralysis because of polio. But irrespective of that, what normally um, has an impact on how you would present with any potential side effect is based on two things. Your genetic background, mm -hmm. all right? The genetics that govern how your defense system works and ultimately the vaccine. An interplay of those two determines how you would present with side effects, whether they'll be mild or severe. Okay. Now, ladies, this has been quite an informative conversation, even as we understood vaccinations better. And uh, for Sahara and uh, Ruth, who are on the ground ensuring that there is optimal uptake of these vaccinations, I'll start off with Ruth. What would you like stakeholders in this sector to help you with to ensure that this uptake is actually 
uh, increased. Ruth. Uh, I would appeal to the st st stakeholders, <coughs> uh, the opinion leaders, uh, the religious leaders, uh, the guardians, the CHVs, uh, to continue sensitizing the community that uh, we have the vaccines uh, for the other fives, also for the 10-year-old girls, and even the uh, AstraZeneca for the COVID-19, we say that uh, it is important uh, to, uh, to give these vaccines uh, in order to prevent these diseases. Uh, so to, uh, the word is uh, to continue sensitizing the community, to continue uh, doing advocacy for these vaccines uh, so that uh, we prevent uh, the diseases for the other fives, uh, the, uh, to prevent the severity for the COVID-19 as we give the AstraZeneca vaccine, mm -hmm. and also for the 10-year-old girls uh, to make sure that uh, they are given uh, the HPV vaccine, uh, the, first, the first dose at first contact and then after six months. Thank you, Ruth. Now, Sahara, definitely you deal with a unique population. Briefly, your clarion call. Okay, my appeal to our stakeholders is one thing they should know is immunization program is a global program for control of vaccine preventable disease mm -hmm. among children and people of all age. And vaccination is one of the interventions that has had a major effect on reduction of mortality and morbidity. Having understood that, I appeal to our key stakeholders who are on the ground to allocate a lot of resource to immunization program so that we reach to these children who are unreached or had to reach with the strategy we have like continuous and sustainable outreach to reach to this hard, hard to reach community. Mm -hmm. Another thing is I will appeal also not only to the stakeholders, our community to understand the benefits of this immunization. Okay, I think she's done with that. And thank you for that appeal. And definitely a good job that you're doing in Wajiri County. Now, Dr. Tari, we had mentioned that mm -hmm. we are not only talking about routine immunization, mm -hmm. we're not only talking about the COVID vaccine mm -hmm. right now. There mm -hmm. are the vaccines that are out there for yeah. uptake for the adults mm -hmm. and, of course, the elderly. Perhaps mm -hmm. you can mention those and the importance of the same even as we close. Yeah. So... Um there are several other vaccines uh, that are available for the elderly. Um, anyway, not so elderly. I mean, <laughs> yeah. even, you know, like teenagers and uh, people in their early adulthood. Uh, one that is available, for example, is the flu vaccine. And this actually is very important, for, especially for people who might be having chronic chest problems, you know. Uh, people who have got terrible asthma. Um, the flu vaccine is available and it's, you know, it's given once a year. Uh, the other one that is important is also the pneumonia vaccine, okay? Um, again, for especially the elderly, you know, pneumonia can really put them down, mm -hmm. so that is available. The other one that's also important is the meningitis vaccine. For example, like our brothers and sisters, when they're traveling to Mecca, you know, for their pilgrimage, that's another important vaccine uh, to have. Other vaccines that are available are things like for hepatitis A, typhoid vaccine and so I think the million dollar question each individual uh, needs to ask themselves is that given their circumstances and their context yeah what are they at risk of high risk of and therefore take strategies to help prevent against that because you know these things also it's not that they are cheap yeah so I mean it's an issue of prioritizing what you feel is a priority for you and, you know, the humble plea I really make, Gladys, to all our Wanainchi, my fellow Wanainchi and citizens, go out and seek the facts. Seek the facts, then make an informed decision. Mm -hmm. Nobody should coerce you. I cannot coerce you to take the vaccine. <laughs> I shouldn't also coerce you not to take the vaccine. Yeah? Anyone who means well for you should give you the facts to allow you to make an informed decision.
Well said, Dr. Yeah. Angela Migoa, rheumatologist yeah. at the Aga Khan University Hospital, Ruth Womboy, who is a health promotion officer at Muranga County. And we are also joined by Sahara Ado, who is a, a, the expanded program of immunization EPI for Cold Point in Wajir County. Ladies, I have learned a lot and I'm sure our viewers have also taken up a lot of important points in as far as vaccination is concerned. And uh, that's it from us this morning, but tomorrow we'll be back on the steering wheel will be my colleague uh, Victor Kiprop who will be taking you through this uh Conversation around the Mental Health Awareness Month. Yes, May is a Mental Health Awareness Month. And tomorrow he's focusing on celebrities. Now, in the last couple of weeks, we've seen different celebrities come out to say they are struggling with one thing or another and even appealed for help to stand on their own two feet. Question is, what more needs to be done, both at a personal level or even industry level, to ensure that these uh, celebrities or those in this industry industry entertainment industry stay or keep their heads above water more tomorrow from 7 a.m see you then Presenting the new Hapik Bathroom Cleaner. Compared to ordinary detergents, its thick formulation gives you superior cleaning and kills 99.9% .9 of germs and viruses all around the bathroom. Blue for the toilet and red for the bathroom. Ni superpoa kuva barakoa. Ni superpoa kuva barakoa. Ye, yeah, unajua kwamba mtu yeyote mwenye umri wa miaka sita au zaidi anaweza kuwa superhero kwa kuvaa barakoa? Ndio kabisa, anaweza. Kama hujafikisha miaka sita, usijali. Wewe pia unaweza kuwa superhero kwa kuwakumbusha ndugu zako na wazazi wako wafae barakoa zao. Kuvaa barakoa kunasaidia kujilinda wewe na kuwalinda wengine dhidi ya virusi. Ni superpower kuvaa barakoa. Hi, my name is Caroline and this is Learning a Minute. I am a mechanic and today I'm going to teach you on how to know which side is your fuel tank. So, to me umeenda pale kwa petrol station. Unajaribu kweka mafuta, uko empty kidogo, gari ni lako, la mwenzako, or you've hired your car. So, the minute that you walk into a petrol station, or you're driving into a petrol station, you have to know whether it's on your left or on your right. How will you know this? Unangalia pale kwa fuel gauge. Kuna katangi kadogo kana shine, ka aru. Kako either left or right. Sasa hapo, di utajua fuel tank yako iko wapi according to the arrow. Iki point left, iko left. Iki point right, iko right. My name is Caroline and this is Learn in a Minute. The budget estimates for the financial year 2021-22 have been tabled in the National Assembly and that tells us we are right in the heart of the budget cycle. What are the key figures and what do they mean for the taxpayer? The intention of the VAT Act in 2013 was to make sure that the exemptions that had been granted after VAT had been passed in the 90s were so many that the law itself was useless.
The deficit alone is close to a trillion. Fiscal consolidation isn't happening. The easiest way to actually have had fiscal consolidation is to suspend these capital projects that the government of Kenya is going through, you know, the big infrastructure projects. It is not stated in plain language, but it is clear that the structural reforms that are required might mean closure, merger, or substantial staff right rationalization. Join us this Tuesday as we speak to the Chief Executive Officer of the Institute of Economic Affairs for this and more. Akiri, 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 Akiri. Let's just the germs away. Let's chase the germs away by keeping our hands clean. And when you want to sneeze or when you want to cough, do it in your elbow. Let's practice sneezing into your elbow. Are you ready? TV turning on your world. The following program has been rated GE. It is therefore suitable for general family viewing. We clapped our hands and stomped our feet. Hi ho, hi ho, hi ho. A rig a tick tick and away we go, away we go, away we go. A rig a tick tick and away. Hi guys, welcome to Generation 3. My name is Stacy Rowero and I hope you're having a wonderful Saturday. Let's start off the show with today's highlights. There is my puppet. They have been designed with your current mission in mind. The first being Invisispray. Whoa. 